hello Ola, you you are on screen and I will yes. hand the chair to you. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much, um, um, Alan. So I should start by thanking um, Miriam and Eve, obviously, for this wonderful conference. Um, so in this panel on professional lives, each of our speakers examines the, diary, the diaries of a prominent public figure, mainly of the um, 19th century, but also the early 20th century. And like some of the diaries we heard about this morning, these diaries are not limited to recording the lives of the diary writer as he or she lived it, as Colin Pooley put it. And so our speakers discuss the role of these diaries more particularly in the public lives and writings of these public figures. Without ignoring the private, they explore the complex imbrication of their diaries with their published writings and examine the questions this genre of writing raised for scholarship, as well as the research avenues they open onto. As to the format, I would like to precede each talk with an introduction of the speaker to give the audience some idea of their individual research agendas within which diaries have emerged as an important source. As with the other panels, the question and answer time will take place after all four presentations. For technical reasons, I will be unable to coordinate that, so I thank um, Alan Packard very much for having kindly volunteered to perform that role. And Alan, just let me say that I did initially propose to take on the uh, the online questions, but actually, technically, that's also apparently an impossibility. Um, thank you. So, turn to our first speaker, um, Sharon um, Rustin. Um, Sharon is professor of English at Lancaster Univers University. Her research explores the relations between the literature, science, and medicine of the Romantic period. 1780 to 1820, and she has authored several books on the subject. Among them, her Shelley and Vitality brings to the fore the medical and scientific context which informed Shelley's concept of vitality in his major poetry. And this interdisciplinary perspective similarly guides her creating romanticism, case studies in the literature, science, and medicine of the 1790s. She co edited the Oxford UP's four volume. Collected Letters of Sir Humphrey Davy, and we will learn more about this major figure of early 19th century chemistry shortly. Last year, Sharon published The Science of Life and Death in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, and she is currently the project leader of an AHRC project, which involves transcribing the voluminous handwritten notebooks of Davy to make them available to both the scholarly and a wider general public. Today, she will discuss a notebook written by Humphrey Davy in 1800, and this notebook contains his ongoing reflections on a poetic project, plans for future prose fiction, but is also interspersed with notes on his electrochemical experiments and autobiographical snippets. She will be talking to us about the deeper correlations which link up this seemingly heterogeneous subject, the seemingly heterogeneous subject matters of Davy's notebook. Entries. Thank you, Sharon. So I'm hoping that you can see these slides. Actually, I can see that you can see these slides. That's great. So Professor Frank James, who I could see on the stage there, um, also speaking in this panel, and I are in the middle of a three-year HRC funded project, which all are very kindly mentioned just then, uh, which aims to transcribe all of Sir Humphrey Davies 75 surviving notebooks. This will be no mean feat, as I'm sure you understand, and we need an army of crowdsourced transcribers to help us. Um, so I hope that this paper uh, will help persuade some of you to take a look at our project on Zooniverse, here's the details here, and even to try and transcribe um, some of the notebooks yourself. And Frank has put some uh, postcards on the registration desk, apparently, with the details on there too. So for those who aren't familiar with Davy, he lived from 1778 to 1829. He was a chemist who isolated lots of chemical elements, but is now perhaps most famous for the miner's safety lamp that became known as the Davy lamp. Here he is. Of course, a notebook is not a diary. Um, I'm trying here to justify my inclusion in this conference, 
Um, some of Davy's notebooks have very specific purposes, but it's also true that in this amazing archive of extant notebooks of a fascinating figure, there are some diary-like entries, many in fact. The notebooks allow us to see the man himself, his thought processes, character portraits of his eminent scientific contemporaries, his to-do lists, his shopping lists, lists of his reading, and his private undiluted opinions. Davy wrote poetry throughout his lifetime and, in, and his notebooks demonstrate that he wrote poetry while in the laboratory, working on chemical experiments. The pages are torn, stained and burned by whatever he's currently using in those experiments. And they move between lines of scientific reporting to lines of poetry. In this talk, I'll give you a flavour of the notebooks first before focusing in on one in particular from Davy's time in Bristol in 1800. And I need here to record my gratitude to the work that the postdocs on the project and others on the project team have done. So some of the research discoveries that I'll mention here um, came from them and some from our citizen science transcribers. The Davy notebooks can be intensely and intimately private, intended for the reader alone, the writer alone to read, you assume. As with all handwritten manuscripts, I think it's the cross the crossings out the insertions and the corrections that often reveal more than the author perhaps intended to reveal. It's intriguing to read somebody else's notebooks. We've already heard uh, some stuff this morning about this, especially when there is material present that may not have been intended for anyone else's eyes. You get a real sense of the person, their interests, hopes, fears, and plans for the future. Davy's notebooks certainly on the whole fulfill this function. And I particularly love finding passages which tell us something of Davy's day-to-day -day life in the lab. Notebook 15F, for example, has a usual mix of poetry and lots of other things. There are scientific experiments, but there are also quotations. So lots of Bacon in this one, but also Milton and others. Classical and mythological references, Cicero, Orpheus in this one. Contemporary scientific references, so William Nicholson, an entry in an encyclopedia. Davy writes uh, notes that he needs to write to Lord and Lady Beaumont. They were patrons of William Wordsworth and Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Davy mentions various geological theories, such as the Plutonian, the Neptunian, and the Hartonian theories. There are a list of monies owed to various people. Some will perhaps never identify, such as a Mr. B in 15F. While he uses this notebook mainly in 1805, interestingly, he returns to use it again to draft his acceptance speech decades later in 1822, when he was elected president of the Royal Society. There are intriguing references to politics, and here, uh, one of my favorites, an unintentionally funny reference to the then prime minister, William Pitt the Younger. Pitt's public parts the greatest. I hope you can see that, you might not be able to. Um, does, it says nothing about Pitt's private parts, which I'm glad, I'm sure you're glad of. Uh, there are sketches of landscapes. Often there are sketches of faces, as you can see here. In 15F, there are drafted contents of the, his forthcoming geological lectures and sketches of the gun barrel that he wanted to be made. There are philosophical musings and many themes recur between the notebooks, such as repeated discussions of pleasure and pain. In 15F, for example, he writes, Pleasure is enhanced by pain, but not pain by pleasure. The more you read of the notebooks, the more you can perceive repeated ideas and concerns. He's often keen, for example, to identify the laws of nature. He is obsessed with the man of genius, his phrase, a, a, a very contemporary phrase. This person is often figured as an, an abstract elite he, and clearly Davy identifies with this abstract person. In 15F, for example, Davy writes in a poem that the man of genius will devote himself to serve the public and ignore the loud applause of multitudes. But we also get moments of first person, more diary-like resolution, apparently heartfelt from Davy himself. So here, never will I complain of destiny or praise my fortune or exult in pride. Anyone who's done a lot of work on Davy knows that this isn't true. Um, so I like this little bit as well. So for the rest of my paper, I'll focus on one notebook, 13D, which Davy kept in Bristol when he was in the daily company of Samuel Taylor Coleridge, Robert Southey, 
um, Peter Mark Roger a bit as well, lots of other people. In this notebook, a good number of pages seem to be devoted to a single poem, presumably never published and variously titled The Child of Genius, Child of Nature, or Lover of Nature, or The Feelings of Eldon. Nothing to do with the Chancellor at the, at the time, I don't think. The poem seems to be autobiographical at times and very much in Davies' poetic style at this time, with very obvious links to earlier written poems such as Sons of Genius and the contemporaneous Life of a Spinozist, another poem. The final pages of this notebook, turned upside down, presumably to allow him to start again, um, concern Davies' nitrous oxide experiments. In this sense, the notebook moves um, from page one to the end, from poetry to science, taken in philosophy, a fictional prose text, autobiographical notes, and ideas for future texts along the way. The Child of Genius is in draft form rather than copied out in fair copy it se and seems to occupy the first six pages of this notebook. The whole poem is a very Wordsworthy and Tintin-esque poem, which I'll come back to again in this paper after describing the rest of the notebook briefly. I think the whole notebook is quite related. Uh, the poem is followed in the notebook by a prose piece, piece titled The Solitary which though still in the first person, still possibly autobiographical, is more philosophical. It seems very connected with the poem The Child of Genius. Perhaps Davy decided to continue the theme that he'd started with the poem, but in prose. Still in the autobiographical mode, for example, Davy writes, amidst the delightful scenery of the Y, I was sometimes for a short time a physiopathist or physiopathist, um, one of Davy's coinages, which is quite interesting. We know that Davy went to the Wye Valley in October of 1800, deliberately to encounter the Wordsworthy and Sublime. He took a bag of nitrous oxide with him uh, for the very purpose. This may have been written in the months before that visit, but it's, this notebook is all around that time. Um, it does work to consider this a kind of continuation uh, with the Child of Genius poem. So the once social being described in the poem is now older in the prose piece, in love with a woman called Aethi, and has turned away from society. So this is interrupted by a first-hand account dated July the 11th, that's why I think it might be before the Y visit, um, that has been quoted by bi biographers David Knight and June Fulmer, as proof of both Davy's romantic sensibilities at this time and of his realization that his was to be a different path to the romantic poets. There are scientific sketches on one page that may be related to Davy's new studies in electricity. There are notes that seem to be things that he wants to write about. So for example, I hope you can see this um, at the bottom of the page, the words, concerning dreams and recollections are written among the, that drawing of scientific instruments. There's lots of interesting material on this page. So for example, Davy writes that infancy and childhood are where the origins of our passions will be found, but states unequivocally that John Locke's theory is incorrect. The doctrine of the mind being a tabula rasa is false, he writes. On the next page, he writes, what is imagination? Um, as Sir Taylor Coleridge would do very famously in his biography of Literaria. On page 24 of this notebook, he uses the notebook, as we all do, to plan his working day. Whether he, ach he achieved this ambitious level of industry is not known. Sorry, there we are. Resolution to work two hours with pen before breakfast on the Lo lover of nature, child always been crossed out, lover of nature or the feelings of Eldon from, from six till eight. From nine till two in experiments, from four till six in, from four to six reading, seven till 10, metaphysical system, i.e. system of the universe. So there we are, starts at six, ends at 10, with no less than a meta metaphysical system. I don't know if he's creating it or reading it or what. This resolution reveals a number of interesting things. Primarily perhaps that his poem was important to him, but it's less important than the work of the main part of his day, 
admittedly that for which is, which is being paid, namely scientific experiments. It also kind of shows his ambition for the day as well. Perhaps not realised. As I've already mentioned, the final pages of this particular notebook have been turned around, presumably so that they could be used for a different kind of writing at the same time as he was writing his poem. These seem to be a version of the introduction and a partial contents list for Davies' researches, chemical and philosophical, chiefly concerning nitrous oxide. The introduction as published is dated by Davy 25th of June, 1800. So around the time that he, that he used this notebook. In the notebook, we see a mixture of what I'm thinking of as the private, which is the poetry and the public, which is the science, but there are links between the two. And, you know, I could think about that a bit more, but basically Davy doesn't publish much of his poetry. We've found a few poems published anonymously, pseudonymously. Um, I th I'm sure there's much more out there. So we know that he publishes uh, a poem in the Gentleman's Magazine, for example, anonymously, but still it seems to be more of a private endeavor um, than the scientific writing which he publishes with his name to it. In the, in the poem, Child of Genius, describing the youth of the child, Davy connects science and poetry. Here through the trembling moonshine of the grove, my earliest lays were wafted by the breeze and here my kindling spirit learned to trace the mystic laws from whose high energy, the moving atoms in eternal change still rise to animation. Davy thus links the sage's earliest lays or his poems to the moment that he learned to trace the mystic laws of science, poetry and science at the same time, and a kind of origin story. In the extended prose fiction of the notebook, the same notebook, 13D, there is a further moment when science and poetry are connected. So the character, the solitary, Davy-esque character, recalls people who had crowned my brows with the laurels of science and who had listened to the wild and simple harp of a son of the mountains. So here again, science and the harp, which represents the minstrel's lay or poetry traditionally, are connected. He has been celebrated, the solitary has been celebrated for his scientific achievements. He's been crowned with the laurel. And they also list, listen to his wild and simple, unsophisticated music. In the poem, he also talks about himself as an Aeolian liar, his quote, new tuned frame responding to the newly found beauty of nature. Um, the Aeolian lyre is a common trope in romantic poetry. Percy Shelley used it, uh, some of the Taylor Coleridge used it. In this notebook then, the private and the public, poetry and science, verse and prose come together, I argue, as a coherent whole. Got much more on that, um, but this is a short paper. There is still much to do on the Davy Notebooks project. And even with this short notebook, I'm so grateful um, to the army of transcribers battling with Davy's handwriting uh, to produce excellently transcribed text for us to consider and to reflect upon. There is so much more to be uncovered and discussed, but hopefully this brief paper on one short notebook gives us some sense of how exciting the work is and of the connections still waiting to be discovered. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. Thank you. Um, very extremely interesting. And I think there will be some um, interesting conversation between yourself, perhaps, and uh, Frank. Oh, no, actually, that's not true. Uh, well, there will be. But. So, uh, the ne our next speaker is Judith Rainhorn, who is Professor of History at Université Paris 1. Her research combines social history, political history, and environmental history to explore two major themes migration and health in the workplace. After her first book, which examines the integration experience of Italian migrants in Paris's Villette neighborhood and New York's East Harlem, she investigated the little studied phenomenon of the relations between neighbors in urban milieu. In a co-edition with Didier Carrier, Strange Neighbors, Otherness and Close Relations in the City since the 18th century. Since then, 
He has published on health and work in the mines from the 19th to the 21st centuries, again from a comparative and global perspective. Most recently, in an award-winning study, he examines the use of poisonous lead oxide in the paint industry throughout the 19th and early 20th centuries. She chronicles the complicity of workers, union leaders, doctors, and the public in the continued recourse to a substance whose toxicity was common knowledge, and this despite the existence of an alternative. Today, she will talk to us about the diary of an American activist who played a prominent role in mobilizing public awareness and legislative reform relating to occupational hazards and workplace suffering. During the interwar years, Alice Hamilton was a professor in industrial medicine at the Harvard Medical School, while also working for the UN Health Committee. Throughout this period, she kept a diary, notably thin on her private life, but Dr. Rainhorn will in illustrate the crucial role of this hidden diary keeping in her extensive corpus of published and private writing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, very happy and grateful to be here. And thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, the story um, I would like to tell today might be one of a disappointment. Disappointment between the expectation of discovering Alice Hamilton's private diaries and the content of what they actually deliver or not deliver to the historian at first sight. So this could be the story of me as a historian finding the archive and hoping to do something with it, uh, as my task is actually to write uh, her biography. It seems to me that one question you can ask yourself when you find a private archive is, is it worth publishing in itself? And here, obviously, the answer is no. Uh, so it's quite a challenging answer, of course. And, and is there, however, a historical interest in this piece? I do believe so. So I'm going to, to look for a few minutes into uh, the diaries kept between 1916 and 1940 by the American physician, Dr. Alice Hamilton, uh, whom I will introduce you briefly. And I actually tried to get around my initial disappointment by trying to get these diaries to speak, to speak for the gaps, the hollows, the absences of the self-narrative. And I think the job of a historian is precisely to fill these silences and gaps, isn't it? So I'm talking here about someone who had an educated uh, background and usually wrote a lot. Uh, but other type of documents. And uh, yet these diaries say very little of her. This is the paradox of a very private self-document, which is to my eyes a non-place of self-presentation, but rather a tool for staging herself through other late, later writings. And there's deserve some historical interest as something like a layer of writing and self-writing. So who is Alice Hamilton? Uh, she was trained as a physician, which was not that uh, unusual for a young woman at the time in the US. And she became a pioneer, succeeding to a certain extent to make visible the invisible occupational hazards and safety uh, and health in the industrial workplace during the American progressive era. So she was uh, an important figure in, in women's social reform circles at that time, and a member of a women's reform community with a special focus on immigrant population in Chicago, uh, which is namely her house, which was ruled by Jane Addams. <clears throat> um, Hamilton later became a professor in industrial medicine at Harvard University Medical School in 1919, and her reputation and academic career opened the doors to international expertise in public and occupational health, and she worked in the interwar period for the League of Nations Health Committee and the International Labour Organization, traveling to uh, international congresses and making field trips in Cairo, in Moscow, for example. Uh, so these are very, very quick features, of course, on her very rich uh, personality and, and, and life. Uh, but you can have a glimpse to see that it is a very remarkable person, which obviously is not the core of my subject today. So she, just to say that she belonged to a generation and a background, again, she was born in 1969, in which diary writing was a well-established practice. Uh, a young girl from an established middle-class educational background uh, 
uh, he, here she is quite uh, young, uh, and she benefited from the teaching of Miss Porter in her famous girls' school based in Farmington, Connecticut, in which the curriculum would include chemistry, botany, astronomy, in addition to math and modern languages, but whom the aim in the end was to teach girls how to become a perfect educated housewife and mother. So Hamilton's parents were not without a paradox. And at the same time, they largely favored the prospect of an individual career for their four daughters, um, none of whom married and all of whom built brilliant career. Edith, the eldest, who became a renowned author on uh, Roman and Greek civilizations, Alice in medicine, Margaret, who became an educator and the headmistress of the very famous Brian Mauer School for girls in, in Baltimore, and Nora, the youngest, was an artist. So one might have expected that within the typical traits of these late 19th century American middle-class girls, keeping a diary would be an obvious occupation, Hence my excitement, which you can imagine when I came across the dozens of little notebooks in Alice Hamilton papers at the Schlesinger Library in Radcliffe College at Harvard University, as I was beginning to think about writing a biography on this quite unusual and outstanding character. And hence my disappointment then, uh, when after having strained my eyes on her small and awkward handwriting, uh, you'll have a look at it uh, very soon, I realized that these notebooks did not say much about the intimacy or interiority of my character. Indeed, it seemed that Alice Hamilton transferred all aspects of introspection and a certain intimacy always very limited, uh, as Rebecca uh, told us uh, this morning in the way she talks about herself, about her body, about her feelings, into her correspondence with her cousin Agnes, who was the same age as her and to whom she was very close, and who was also part of the large family group in which the Hamiltons uh, raised their children as a tribe, we could say, in Fort Wayne, Indiana, in the 1870s and 1880s. So it is, of course, possible to speculate that Alice Hamilton actually kept an early diary which she did not later deposit in her papers and archives, but of course it is not available to historians anyway. So among the many writings in Alice Hamilton's paper, these little diaries, those have a very special status, I think. So let's move to the um, materiality of the diaries as artifacts, as you can see, oops, sorry, no, here. Uh, as you can see uh, on the screen now. So first of all, we know the variety, the, the diversity of forms, and titles. As you can see here, Hamilton did not choose to buy or be provided with an identical notebook each year, and there is no continuity between them. Among the 23 remaining annual not notebooks, each one is different from the others in terms of color, size, shape, and introductory inscription. As can be seen from the picture here, <clears throat> they bear different titles various titles like diary or standard diary like in 24 and 29 or lest we forget in 28 or just 1940 uh, or daily reminder like in 32 or reminder like in 1939. Some have a left right opening format and others open from top to bottom and the colors also are varied brown blue red black as you can see some are covered with leather uh, some in canvas oops sorry um, one is personalized. Uh, at the bottom, you can see it, uh, Alice Hamilton Hell House. Most others are not. Some fit in the pocket, while others are larger. But all of them are quite small, easy to be carried in a pocket or in a small bag, uh, which matches with their main use, actually, to note down on the spot or immediately, retrospectively, the daily uh, authors' peregrinations, appointments, correspondence, often read, for example, the mention, I wrote to X, Y, Z, or very f uh, few fleeting feelings. Uh, the inside materiality now of the diaries is also important to note, because all the diaries are pre-printed, as you can see here, with the day's date. Uh, the space, so the space devoted to each day is therefore pre-established and very restricted, actually. Sometimes writing overflows from a particularly, particularly busy day, and while other days are left quite empty, which is uh, actually in, uh, uncommon, let's say. 
She wrote in ink, but most often still in pencil, in a very hard to read handwriting. If you can help me, I'm very, I would be very grateful because sometimes I, I can't do it really, uh, with many abbreviations and a style uh, that is always telegraphic, sometimes mere family names with the persons uh, of the person she meets with the correct spelling underlined as if she were afraid of getting them wrong. Uh, and giving some details about her transportation mean, uh, means or incidents. In, in this example here, uh, you can have a glimpse of, um, um, sorry, yes, that's, that's this one actually, uh, uh, this extremely sober, we could say, or minimalist style uh, on Tuesday, 21st of January. So the, the bottom day uh, on this picture, globe to Clifton, early stand, Train change to San Carlos and Solomon, noon at Solomon, stage to Duncan, breakdown in desert, train at Gile to Clifton, Rairdon Hotel, to Mine Company. This very minimalist style contrasts sharply with Hamilton's other numerous writings, the letters in her correspondence, which are very literary, very sophisticated, or her professional mission reports, which are details, uh, detailed and explicit all the text of her public speeches, which are very numerous and which alternate between social and political statements and personal reminiscences. And finally, her autobiography, uh, sorry, it's here, um, autobiography, um, Exploring the Dangerous Straits, which was published in, in 1943. She was then 74 years old. So we must face the facts. Her practice of diary keeping is rather than of a on the spot and immediate retrospective notepad. Uh, these diaries say very little about Hamilton's intimacy again, thoughts and self introspection. They say very little as well on her, on her daily life, which must be sought in her autobiography and her correspondence of which the diaries are one of the basic supporting elements. So, what then is the historical interest of this source? That will be my last point. Uh, diving into these diaries, which cover approximately 25 years of Hamilton's professional life, what is immediately striking is the extraordinary richness of her life and comparatively the dryness or poorness of her diaries. Again, there are a few scribble notes on each page which make a kind of narrative for her manifold activities, the weather and temperature, who she's been sharing meals with, the places she's been visiting, the means of transport she's been using, a few names dropped on the small pages are barely the scattered information that one can find uh, in them. As an example here, uh, you can see on the page of her 1924 trip in Eastern Europe, which is very emblematic of the whole source. Um, here, no, sorry, here, uh, at, at the top of it. Warsaw, chill and dreary. Uh, Dr. Bitter's man came for me in a Ford and we went to Rubber Works, which is actually one of the industrial sectors she's investigating at that time. Afternoon shopping for paper and extra food. Evening, yes, Igor at Opera House. Trains not running. Of course, this is valuable information uh, and this is nowhere else, uh, as this is nowhere else in her papers, but it remains quite dreary itself, uh, except for knowing that Ford Company had already exported cars to Poland in 1924. That's an information, but still from her, same for her trip to Germany and France in 1919, it's very interesting to compare the poor information she gave in her diaries, uh, like for example here, to devastated uh, regions, Saint Lys, Vic sur Rennes, Le Nouvion, all devastated. And the beautiful and long articles she's been writing afterwards on this specific trip on deprivation, hunger in Northern France and Belgium in 1919, and the necessity of humanitarian help to Germany in order to avoid the starvation and humiliation of German people with the Versailles tr Treaty, which could lead to a future war. She was actually quite visionary in that extent. Back to copper mines in Arizona, which was my first example uh, in 1919, a few months earlier. Um, it's interesting to compare again various ways of writing. Like here, you can you can you can actually hardly read Humboldt Mine, Arizona Company, Accident to Miner, Miners Headquarters, Garcia and Vargas, with the final S, which is emphasized. Um, 
and then Yankee Mine, oh, sorry, it's that one maybe, yes, here. Yankee Mine Adventurous. And this Yankee Mine Adventurous, these three words, gives the way to three whole pages in a very epic and, and uh, terrible narrative she wrote in her autobiography 20 years later on the same episode on this Yankee Mine Adventurous because she told uh, how she went down the mine pit, how she tried the worker's tool, uh, how she felt scared uh, down there with the smell, the dark, the fumes, uh, the noise, which were actually 800 feet deep. And it's really striking to compare this type of writing. So again, the diaries are clearly tools to write another narrative, staging herself as a very courageous and brave woman, investigating, investigating violent male workplaces, often putting her, li her life at risk uh, in order to make visible the invisible, uh, the, sorry, <laughs> the invisible uh, terrible working condition in this um, industrial America at that time. So to conclude, and because uh, time is actually flying, I would like to say that the historical interest of these documents mainly lie in the, lies, sorry, in the, in the comparison one can make between these and the manifold ways of telling her life and work ex uh, Hamilton has experienced. These diaries are full of negligible information, but often lack what seems essential during Hamilton's trip in Arizona Copper Belt in 1919, I have showed a few slides on this earlier, she received the information by cable that she was appointed professor at Harvard University Medical School, being the first woman to enter Harvard University at that time. And you cannot find even a mention of this huge information, which was going to change her life and professional path. So it actually made me um, think of, uh, you know, Louis XVI, the King of France, who uh, knows, uh, everybody knows that on his diary on the 14th of July, 1789, he wrote nothing. Uh, the word nothing, it, it's something like that, actually, that you can draw from this. Um, so these are therefore documents not intended to be shared either within the family or within the professional community. And Hamilton Diaries do not expect any reader at any point except herself. Uh, so it is an entirely private document, essentially informative, and yet its author has chosen to include it in her private archive, which she has deposited uh, within the Radcliffe Institute at Harvard University, where she taught for 15 years. And she made, and she deposited this herself. Uh, so it is therefore essential, essentially an archive that shows Alice Hamilton at work, the way she organized her writing. So a useful tool for staging herself in other writings, her political speeches, articles, and her, of course, her autobiography. So other pieces that serve to self-portray the historical figure that she ended, in, intended to be. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that uh, very stimulating talk. Uh, time is uh, not on our side, so um, uh, I'll pass straight to um, our next speaker, uh, Frank James. Frank James is Professor of History at University College London. Like our other panellists, his research is interdisciplinary and his work explores the physical sciences in the late 18th and 19th centuries and their interrelations with the period's cultural, social, technological and religious productions and artefacts. He has edited the correspondence of one of the history of science science's most well-known figures, Michael Faraday, and is the author of the Oxford UP Introduction to Faraday's Work and Life. He has also published an edition of Faraday's Chemical History of a Candle. More recently, working with Sharon Rustin, um, his attention has turned to the work of Humphrey Davy, and he is currently preparing a monograph on Davy's work, not just as, to use the terminology of the time, a chemical philosopher, but also as a person who's interested in science, um, embraced its potential application in a wide variety of projects, some of them quite surprising. Um, today, however, he will not be talking about Davy, but about the notebooks Faraday kept over 40 odd years from 1820 to 1862. The notebooks contain records of his discoveries in electromagnetic rotations and induction, the universal nature of magnetism and the formulation of field theory, a cornerstone of modern physics. 
Um, Frank will discuss Faraday's sophisticated information retrieval system, which involved numbering each paragraph so that the notes could be used to index and cross-reference. He will also show how these voluminous notes, first published in the 1930s as Faraday's diary, are revelatory of the proximity between the scientific notebook and diary genre. Thank you. Thank you all, and all that in 15 minutes. Um, so Faraday worked all his life at the Royal Institution uh, in Albemarle Street in central London. Um, and I suppose the question I'm going to be asking is, did Faraday keep a diary? When I sort of thought about it, jotted down uh, in a completely random order, all the scientific figures or some of the scientific figures I could think of who kept diaries. Uh, I didn't, I was able to fill a PowerPoint slide uh, very quickly. Now, all these diaries are sort of different. Um, Herbert McLeod, for example, kept a diary every day of his life from 1860 until three days before his death in 1923. That's sort of 63 years. Uh, Benjamin Thompson, Graf von, um, Max Graf von uh, Rumford, uh, kept a diary for a few months in order to, to, as part of his exercise of trying to court, unsuccessfully, I think, uh, by Countess Palmerston. And what about Faraday? Well, Faraday did actually um, keep uh, a non-laboratory notebook diary, uh, especially when he was on the tour with Davy uh, from 1813 uh, to 1815, where they went round the continent. And Faraday uh, kept a fairly detailed diary uh, of where they went and what they uh, did, which he then wrote up neatly. Uh, with the key word for Faraday is neatness, uh, which can Passed somewhat with uh, Davy, one has to say. Returning to England, Faraday was reappointed laboratory assistant at the Royal Institution and so had access to the uh, RI's laboratory notebooks. This is one uh, page um, in which Davy recorded some of his major uh, discoveries, particularly in electrochemistry. And as with the uh, Nicholson picture of the webs, um, you can see in this picture Davy's. Uh, notebooks uh, scattered uh, scattered around, just to sort of remind the viewer uh, that uh, these are important uh, to the development of Davy's career. Uh, this page is actually in Faraday's hand, and the Davy Notebooks project is going to also um, uh, publish and transcribe and edit all, all the laboratory notebooks in the RI, even though a, a, a large part of those notebooks uh, aren't in Davy's hand, which does make life somewhat simpler, I have to say. Um, this is actually Faraday's own personal laboratory notebooks, um, which he kept from 1820 until 1862. And they also appear scattered around uh, in this photograph, probably sometime in, in the 1860s, here and here, with Faraday holding uh, the, the world's first electric generator, uh, which still exists and is here on display in the Royal Institutions Museum. And this is the notebook uh, where he uh, records uh, that work in 1831 uh, when he made uh, this device. Now notice on this notebook that what Faraday does is having made rough notes in his basement laboratory, he goes up to his study on the first floor of the RI and writes those notes out very neatly. This is why Faraday is so neat. Uh, so we don't actually have the original uh, no, uh, the original notes, uh, except one, two minor cases. And then from this, he writes his papers to be published in the Philosophical Transactions of the World Society of London. And to make sure he doesn't uh, duplicate material, he draws a pencil line all the way through a page when he's finished with that page uh, in writing his paper, uh, which is a sort of way of making sure he's, A, remembered to put, include everything, but also remembers that he's already done it. So it's his memory device. And Faraday always thought he had a bad memory. Uh, in my view, Faraday's bad memory is anybody else's good memory, but his memory is very much a matter uh, of perception, as we heard earlier. And that's an up-to-date, uh, so that's a larger picture of that image. And notice in here, Faraday's already started numbering his paragraphs at 61. Um, he starts this a number of times before 
uh, finally settling on his final numbering system. Now, the laboratory notebooks don't only contain um, Faraday's written uh, material, they also include these uh, field diagrams. These are the uh, diagrams that Faraday made uh, using a very clever process of iron filings and wax. Uh, and are actually the world's earliest iron filing uh, diagrams. Curiously enough, um, and I have looked very carefully, you don't get iron filing diagrams uh, until the, this time in the 1840s and 50s, um, uh, which is a bit worrying about how people perceived lines of force around a magnet at the time. Now Faraday's most important um, discovery, arguably, uh, is that of electromagnetic induction, the world's first electric transformer, made on 29th of August 1831. And unfortunately, Faraday just comes into the laboratory saying experiments on the production of electricity from magnetism, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which is not the most helpful uh, entry uh, that you can imagine for such an important discovery. There's no, there's no leading up uh, to that. But on the basis of that discovery. Uh, Faraday was seen uh, from the late 19th century as the founder of electrical engineering. And in 1931, to mark the centenary of Faraday's discovery of electromagnetic induction, the most enormous exhibition was held in the Albert Hall, devoted entirely to Faraday and electrification, um, and was open for about three or four weeks. And people like the Prime Minister and Jan Smuts uh, came through and visited it. Now, this exhibition and all the associated events uh, were masterminded by William Bragg, um, director of the Royal Institution uh, in the interwar years, Nobel Prize winner in 1915 for his work, fundamental work with his son, Lawrence Bragg, uh, on X-ray crystallography. Um, and it is Bragg who seems to introduce the word diary to describe uh, the Faraday's notebooks. Um, it's, first, it's first introduced in a lecture that Bragg gives in 18, 1928. I've not found an earlier reference, um, and it does seem to be a device to make, make, make the whole volumes look much more friendly, much more user friendly than the word laboratory, than the words laboratory notebooks. And due to the success of the 1931 celebrations, it was decided uh, to print, to publish, transcribe, and publish. Uh, all the diaries, and they turn up eventually in seven huge uh, volumes. Bell published the um, uh, volumes, um, and interestingly enough, Bell later published in the 1960s uh, Pepys's, the final definitive edition of Pepys's diaries. The publishers quoted £2,200 to the Royal Institution as the cost. Um, and they raised a subscription of £3,000 to publish it. That was clearly not sufficient. Publishers then as now never quite get their estimates right. And by 1934, um, uh, the RI had to sub subsidize this by just over £1,000. And I suspect it went higher, but I haven't been able to find uh, the records. And I think that's, I think we, we talked a bit this morning about the publication uh, of diaries. And I think, the economics of publishing diaries is really interesting. I think, again, that's linked to the sort of actually calling this a diary rather than a laboratory notebook. I think had Bell advertised as a laboratory notebook, um, they would have knocked up the 242 subscriptions uh, that they did get uh, for this. Uh, the reason why I've shown David Gooding was because uh, he uh, bequeathed this, his set of uh, uh, no, a diary to me, uh, heavily annotated as a sort of historical document uh, in its own right. This is the first page, um, starting in September 1820. And no, it's an absolutely normal notebook, nothing particularly spectacular about it at that point. By 1821, he's begun to realize that you actually need to number the paragraphs. So in pencil, in this book, he sort of numbered, he sort of numbered the individual paragraphs. And down here, by the way, is, is Faraday's drawing of the first electric motor uh, that he made in, on 3rd and 4th September, 1821. He had another go at sort of num starting numbering, but that sort of ran out of steam after about 300 paragraphs. And then in 1832, uh, he began on the 25th of August, with paragraph one and finish that sequence 
on the 6th of March, 1860, with paragraph 16,041, um, which is, I've always found to be quite remarkable. Oops, sorry. Right, slightly out of order. Um, and what Faraday would do would be to cross-reference. So this paragraph here, here which would be 10,287, he refers back to a paragraph uh, of 2007, 10, 000, so 9,071 uh, back. And here he refers forward. And occasionally he puts in just empty brackets, expecting to go back at some point and uh, number the paragraphs. Um, and then he would compile indexes. And so you get this, this quite remarkable thing that Faraday, say in 1850, would refer back to an experiment uh, he'd done in the mid 18, 1830s. Um, and it's all a really creative uh, process. And it's this process that, that really attracted the interest of people like David Gooding and Ryan Tweeney uh, in the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, David Gooding uh, used uh, Faraday's diary uh, to develop this really sophisticated system of not notating uh, scientific cre creativity. I shan't go into the details of that, but each shape represents a particular operation uh, in experiment or in uh, theorizing. And Ryan Tweeney, a cognitive psychologist, uh, uh, still started developing uh, ideas related Work using using neural neural networks at that time uh, to sort of uh, develop ideas about how also Faraday set about making these fundamental uh, natural philosophical physical uh, uh, discoveries. So with all that, it is not too surprising um, that these notebooks, um, both as a, as historical items, as items that are still valuable not only to historians of science but to uh, computational scientists and uh, neuroscientists um, have been have have developed a certain iconic uh, quality and when i was in charge of the collections and the archive at the royal institution a few years ago uh, with hardly any difficulty at all which is unusual in my experience uh, i was able to get them uh, registered uh, on the unesco memory of the world register and that's uh, that's from their web page thank you Thank you very much. Time is, uh, well, I think we're actually already a little bit, we're heading towards being over time. Um, so I will hastily present our next and final speaker. David Brown is Professor of Modern History at the University of Southampton. His research explores 19th century political history and social reform, philanthropy and foreign policy. In his first book, Palmerston and the Politics of Foreign Policy, 1846 to 55. He examines the political career of Lord Palmerston as Foreign Secretary and Prime Minister. He subsequently published Palmerston, a biography with Yale UP, and he has recently co-edited the Oxford Handbook of Modern Bl British Political History, 1800 to 2000. Pursuing his interest in 19th century phil philanthropy, and its role in the development of modern civil society, David's focus has turned to one of the period's most prominent proponents of philanthropy, the seventh Earl of Shaftesbury. As the holder of a Leverhulme major research fellowship, David is currently preparing a fully annotated four volume edition of Shaftesbury's diaries to be published by Oxford UP. Today, David will be talking to us about Shaftesbury's ambiguous and fraught relationship with his own very extensive diary keeping. Despite repeated threats to destroy the diaries, Shaftesbury finally handed them over to his biographer. Considering the variegated composite that make up the diaries from historical record, Ed Memoir to spiritual journey, David addresses the question of its addressee, to whom was Shaftesbury writing and why? And from there he turns to the question of the use of the diaries as a historical source. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you very much indeed for a, a more than generous uh, introduction. Um, I'm very conscious that this paper 
uh, is jagged around the edges because it comes from a much bigger piece of uh, work, but hopefully that might snag interest or attention here and there, but apologies for rushing through. Um, I should also say I'm going to refer to Shaftesbury as Shaftesbury throughout, even though he was known as Lord, Ash Lord Ashley until 1851, but I don't want to confuse things any more uh, than necessary. So uh, Shaftesbury is hopefully reasonably well known, um, if not um, the very briefest of pen portraits. Uh, I might point out that he's perhaps best known to social historians as the aristocratic philanthropist who led parliamentary campaigns to limit the use of child labor in textile factories, to abolish the use of child chimney sweeps, the champion of education for the poor, and throughout his career devoted endless hours to the work of the Lunacy Commission. These things and much else. The so-called poor man's earl devoted himself to speaking of what we might call the voiceless exploited victims of industrial progress. He served intermittently in the House of Commons from 1826 until elevated to the House of Lords in 1851, and he enjoyed a wide and influential political network. He was friends at different times with people like the Duke of Wellington, Sir Robert Peel, Lord Palmerston, the Queen, Prince Albert. Um, in that context, it's also quite amusing to me, at least, to be talking about him as a professional. I think he probably would have described himself as an amateur. He never really held formal office apart from brief ministerial uh, 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 appointments that, that had nothing really to do with what he's particularly known for. And Shaftesbury was above all a deeply religious man, motivated throughout his life by his evangelicalism and his diaries as much a window into the evangelical mindset as a record of Victorian social and political history between 1825 and 1885. So the diary. On the 28th of September, 1838, having kept a journal sporadically since 1825, but by 1838 not having done so for over three years, Shaftesbury opened a new notebook and wrote the first entry of what he intended would be a more consistent attempt at keeping a diary. And I apologize, this is a lengthy quote, but it's quite an interesting one for an editor, for an editor to be confronted with uh, at, the, at the start of a project. Everyone who begins to keep a journal regrets that he did not do so before. I follow the general example and regret the many fine and apt things, both of fact and imagination, that are now irrevocably lost. I had a book a few years ago in which I made from time to time some short desultory entries, but the natural impatience of my disposition and the mischievous and indulged habit of doing nothing conscientiously broke the thread of my record, and I now resume a business which will conjoin a head and a tail by the exclusion of all intermediate carcass. Yet an actual journal, a punctual narrative of every day's history, will be an intolerable bore, a bore when written and a bore when remembered. At least it would be so to me. The probability is that this book of memorandums will share the fate of all my other attempts and go into oblivion, unsullied by ink or pencil, but should it be carried on, I will make it a mere cage for light and great thoughts, the paucity of them will make, render the task easy, which unless they be caught as they arise, take wing like larks and owls and are gone forever. If I were a man of eminence or likely to be so, such an undertaking as this would be rather hazardous at least if I hope to preserve it as a memorial for myself alone, a secret of my, most in, of my inmost thoughts. My drawers and my papers would be ransacked for some precious remains, an invaluable document, his private diary would be presented to the public, and all the little ebullitions of gaiety or sorrow, of vanity, anger, and self-humiliation would be displayed before the world as charming illustrations of the real man when in converse only with himself. There's quite a lot in there, I think. And yet, that diary was eventually presented to the public, with Shaftesbury's consent and even endorsement, albeit in highly abbreviated and carefully edited form in 1887 in Edwin Hodder's Life and Work of the Seventh Earl of Shaftesbury. He'd been reluctant to agree to an official life, and if anyone did insist on writing that life, then Shaftesbury said they should rely on his public speeches. The diaries, whose existence was known about, were, he said, quite unsuited to the public eye, and he'd long since drafted instructions for them to be destroyed after his death, a plan that fortunately was not fulfilled. By 1884, the year before his death, and as his health was ev evidently declining, Shaftesbury's view began to soften, and he warmed to the idea when Cassell proposed putting the project in the hands of Hodder, a civil servant who had written a number of works on history, biography, geography, and religion, including some important hymnaries and who soon convinced Shaftesbury that he would be a sympathetic biographer. But the question remained, 
what to make of the diary. And here's a typical page. Shaftesbury eventually handed all of his private diaries to Hodder, saying that he must leave it at your discretion what use you make of them. Oh, sorry, to, to make what use of them you like. Apologize. Hodder, judging that in the diary Shaftesbury had in fact written his own life, quoted from the diary liberally, if selectively. While many welcomed the inclusion of fulsome extracts from the diary, others thought that Shaftesbury's reputation might have been better served had the diaries indeed been burned. The noted social historians Lawrence and Barbara Hammond, for instance, thought the diary was little more than a mocking mirror. But it was not only Shaftesbury's reputation and sensibilities that were at stake. Reading Hodder's biography and finding unflattering entries concerning himself, William Gladstone regretted what I had used to reflect upon with pleasure, that I had broken bread at Lord Shaftesbury's table, for he must have been a reluctant host. There were all sorts of very critical comments on Shaftesbury, on Gladstone and others in the diary. Gladstone complained not only that Shaftesbury criticised him, but that the world should be able to read what had been committed to paper in private. And significantly, therefore, for this, he blamed the biographer or editor and not the diarist. It's instructive, therefore, to read Shaftesbury's own reaction to the publication of Queen Victoria's Leaves from the, Leaves from the Journal of Our Life in the Highlands in January 1868, of which he wrote, the Queen has published her private diary, all that she thinks and does in the inmost escapes of her heart and home. This is very strange. Such a thing prepared for publication and issued in the lifetime of the writer and by herself loses all the grace and reality of nature and becomes a mere production of calculation and art. Are such revelations advisable? Published after the lapse of a century or so, or after the death of the author, who must have had no thought that they would ever see the world, these records are curious and interesting. But published, as this is, whatever adulation or courtesy may say, is an ill-advised Ill attempt to obtain popularity and admiration. Shaftesbury's observation on Victoria's Vic Journal underline important questions about the perceived privacy, intimacy, and ultimately audience of the diary. The published diary is a relatively recent phenomenon, and the personal diary was long regarded as an inherently private document. And indeed, published versions of a diary often still read them as something essentially private. But studies of diary writing and keeping have also stressed that while diaries might appear ostensibly private, the fact that many were written collaboratively as well as singly, were shared and circulated as well as hidden away, means that many, perhaps most diarists, wrote with some expectation or maybe fear of publicity. Editors of published diaries have frequently taken the preservation of the material itself as evidence that the author recognized that they would be more widely read. As his diary evolved, so arguably did Shaftesbury's awareness of the limits of that supposed privacy and his ability to keep it to himself. Indeed, he would write in 1856, making an interesting distinction, I think, between a journal and a true diary. Journals must be prepared, I'm sure, for publication, either by the author or the editors. A man who makes his entries with the knowledge that they will come before the world will, imperceptibly to himself, shape them for such an issue. A true diary, a real journal, an accurate record of the daily life, thoughts, feelings, words, actions of the best of men would exhibit such error, such inconsistency, such workings of the mind and spirit as to furnish matter for jeer, scoff, hatred, simulated regrets, true and false accusation, and doubts of the actuality of religion, which no argument could set aside and individual experience alone would counteract. Acknowledging that a diary is or may be written with an awareness of a readership beyond the author, whether that's defined as public or not, has inevitably generated questions as to the diary's authenticity, if that means freedom from dissembling, and the writer's sincerity, to question the reliability of the diary and to search out examples of self-censorship and self-consciousness to set against a supposedly true account. But perhaps this is just as much a question about the nature of readership as authorship. Who reads what are often difficult to decipher records? And why are certain diaries deemed worthy of study and attention in the first place? Do we read Shaftesbury's diary because of what it says and how, or because of who said it? Of course, the answer can be a blend of some or all of these things. But the diary is thus not 
or is it rarely a guileless or simple document? Just at the moment he began his own diary in earnest, Shaftesbury recognized this for himself. He was in the autumn of 1838, reading the recent lives of William Wilberforce and Sir Walter Scott, and was prompted to reflect that, quote, for a time at least, we shall have very few more journals, very few more journals artlessly and sincerely written. Many a man is now stuffing his papers with rich originalities and sweet traits of character, enjoying by anticipation the praise of posterity. But beyond the praise of posterity, and here I want to turn to the significance of Shaftesbury's religiosity. Historians of the diary have long recognized a connection between the personal diary and a process of self-examination as part of a Protestant ethic, particularly important when considering the diarist who described himself as the evangelical of the evangelicals. Born of the account books of the medieval and early modern world, the diary evolved to become an account of one's personal economy, financial, emotional, and spiritual. William Gladstone, another great Victorian diarist, described his own diary as an account book of the all precious gift of time. And in the increasingly regulated industrial age, time had to be spent wisely. Not to do so was a moral failing. So what was Shaftesbury's diary? What was it for? And should we talk about a diary or diaries? We may consider the diary or journal as written in a number of forms and registers simultaneously and for an unspecified number of readers and types of reader. Hodder described Shaftesbury's motives as threefold, to assist his treacherous memory, to be a source of amusement to him in his old age, particularly the dirt section is recording travels, and as an exercise to help overcome his almost insuperable aversion to writing. It was arguably a more sophisticated document than this would suggest. Shaftesbury's diary was an amalgam of autobiography, general historical record, aid memoir, spiritual journal or dialogue with God, and a medium for self-reflection, self-development, and what can be called self-fashioning. But the impulse to keep that diary became self-perpetuating. What's inescapable in reading Shaftesbury's diary is that it became a duty. Whenever returning to the diary after a hiatus, a gap, or an interval, Shaftesbury would lament the loss of thoughts, the incompleteness of it as a record, and his self-criticisms speak of the need to maintain an, ac an account of his life, to develop a sort of faithful mirror. Rebecca Steinitz, indeed, cites Shaftesbury's diary as a good example of writing in the evangelical tradition, which encouraged diary writing explicitly as a record of spiritual and moral activity, as a means of prayer and self-improvement, or what Edward Bickersteth, another evangelical, called the secret prayer. Consider, for instance, as two examples from the diary from 1834 uh, and 1856. After years of interval, I return to my book. Now I regret the long omission. Much might have been inserted to improve and interest me. The coarse or vanity of one's feelings, the hopes we've entertained with their accomplishment or disappointment, our distrust or reliance upon God, our often or seldom prayer with their respective efforts upon thought and action, all these things duly recorded would assail us, as it were, with irresistible conviction. Let me henceforth be a little more punctual. And again in 1856, my book begins to irk me now, partly because I've less and less leisure every day, and partly because I find less and less use in a record. No time to revise it and compare past with present. No taste to let it survive me, for it is a true picture of hopes and fears, of doubts and difficulties, of hasty joys and hastier disappointments, of weak gratitude and strong murmuring, of frequent unbelief and unfrequent faith, of my life and of my mind. Who can judge this truly but God? And who would judge it in mercy but God? And here I think we see this notion of the account book of time and the moral duty to account for one's life. And in a record to be judged by God, Shaftesbury was also creating his book of the self. Shaftesbury used expensive notebooks, hard backed with marbled end papers and made with thick, high quality paper. This might suggest that he had <clears throat> excuse me, an eye to posterity, or at least wrote with a thought about preservation of the record in mind. The openings of two relatively early volumes for 1843 to five and 45 to seven are both inscribed with hopes of a blessing to mark the first and last pages, which I think speaks of a developing consciousness of the diary as a book of the self, physically encasing accounts of defined periods of that life. Several subsequent volumes open and close with reflections on mortality, prompted by the confinement of past life to a closed book 
and its continuation in a blank one, the confrontation of a life measured across filled or to be filled pages. While the diarist's motives can perhaps still never fully be known, we might reflect yet on the extent to which the physical act of writing a life down, cataloging it almost in chapters or volumes, develops its own momentum or even obligation to continue rather than leave an unfinished book, another form of duty. And so just as Shaftesbury's own view of his diary is equivocal, so too is the use we might make of it multifaceted. And in producing a public version of this private document, as I'm doing, the role of the editor is also problematic and shouldn't be forgotten. I was struck this morning when we talked about gatekeepers and editors. We might all talk about, talk, talk about the editor as a co-producer or even co-author in some senses. And so while my current project in publishing that diary does what Shaftesbury professed to deplore, it's not clear that in doing so, I have necessarily ransacked his drawers and papers for some precious remains in a way he would altogether have regretted. Thank you.